Kendra, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you. <laughs> hey, I've I've never met a Kendra before. Is that is it is that a common name in the states? No, um, you know what's interesting though. Well, there's a couple things that are interesting. Just stop me if this is not where you want to go with this. Yeah. But number one, my mother did not name me for ten days. Mm. And then the story goes that she took me up. It, we lived in San Francisco. I was born in San Francisco. And so there's often like roof decks in the big buildings in San Francisco. So it's not like she took me up on the roof. She like, but, but she took me up on the big um, roof deck of the house, like the, the building that we lived in. And she told me my name first. So nobody knew my name before I knew my name, except for my mother. And then we have this other thing. I don't know. Maybe now this is around the world, but it's definitely in the, in the States when I was growing up, which is like these little bicycle license plates. Mm-hmm. And they look just like, or they're in California. So they look just like a California license plate, but they're like miniature. And, and the weird thing is Kendra is not a common name, mm-hmm. but I would find a, like the Kendra license plate in the little souvenir shops. Oh, wow. So, and I was like, that's, that's strange. Usually it's like, the, the, I don't know, the quote unquote normal names. So yeah, it's like yeah. Lauren and Beth and, um, and then as I was growing up, I would always, people, I would say my name and they would say, oh, I know, I have a sister or I have a cousin. Or, so I would always meet people who knew somebody, but I never met another Kendra until like five years ago. Oh, well, until five years ago. Mm-hmm. Jeez. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, I don't, I just, like I said, I don't think I've ever met one. It's weird that you see that though. It's kind of like that when you buy a blue car and the blue cars are yeah. everywhere and. Yes. <laughs> you know, I um I love San Francisco. I've been there a couple of times and um I actually interviewed a guy named Kevin Briggs who was the patrol officer for the Golden Gate Bridge and he was responsible for um just talking with people and helping them off the bridge and all that sort of stuff. But it's such a fascinating city, you know, even just the the, the topography of it, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love San Francisco too. Yeah. Are you where are you based now? I'm about 90 minutes north of San Francisco. Pretty, I'm not right on the coast, but I'm pretty much just straight north. I'm probably like 20 minutes from the coast. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. Beautiful. And yeah. the, were, the, were the bushfires in the southern part of California or were they? They were actually in the north. We, I don't, I think maybe we had a, a fire down in Southern California recently, mm. but there were, um, we actually have had a lot of fires up here in Northern California, mm. really for the last four years, like every work, you know, it's, it's now it's called fire season. I'm like, don't call it that. That makes it sound like a thing that has to happen. <laughs> oh, no. um, it's, it's pretty intense. Mm. It's pretty intense. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. We, we've had, we had some shocking ones here um, in the beginning and a lot of our wildlife just died and you know, that, that the way to die is, is terrible, you know, but it's funny, there were hours away east from where we live here in, in the southern part of Australia, but just the smoke, you know, yeah. just seeing that smoke and then you just get this idea of what it must be like at ground zero, how much worse it would be, you know? Yeah. Wasn't that though, I mean, I think this is so indicative of 2020 because wasn't that like in January? Yes. Yes. And it's one of those things like, was that really this year? You know, I mean, at that time, I think we thought like, oh my God, this is like the worst thing that's going to happen this year. <laughs> I know, I know. And globally, we felt it, you know, even though it was in Australia, it was sort of this global, like, like really the feeling of that. And then mm. um, it's, it's just been kind of a shit show all year. <laughs> so, it has been the most <laughs> bizarre year of all time. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm 27. <laughs> it's just like everything that could go wrong at some point. I was talking to my partner, Siobhan. It's just like, at some point you just kind of have to sit back and like, are we actually, is this real life right now? Yeah. Yeah. It's just insane. Hey, well, um, Kendra, I suppose um, one of the reasons why I wanted to get you onto the show is because I think um, we found you through, um, you know, the, the kind of the, the spiritual intimacy work that's out there. And um, I was interested in, in reading about your life path as well, that you, you were first introduced to um, David Data in, in the nineties from, from memory. And he was kind of the book, uh, you know, the way of the superior man was something that um, I came across um, funnily enough when my partner recommended it to me. So I don't know what she was trying to say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's a, it's a fantastic book. And I was interested, I, I, like I said to you before the show, I never have any, script going into this but the first question that I did want to ask you was um what was it like reading um 
David's work um, from the aspect of the, I'm assuming, feminine side of things? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say a couple of things. One is um, that my introduction to him was actually going and seeing him in person. Oh, wow. Which is good because I don't, I mean, well, I don't know, this is horrible. I shouldn't say these things publicly. Number one, I'm not a huge fan of his writing. Mm. Um, I think he has a body of work that's important. Like this is the way I've always described it is he had something that needed to be said. And so he wrote, you know, and then there's people yeah. who are writers and then, and, and so they write whatever. Um, so I don't mean that really as a criticism, but just personally, like I never found the writing itself that captivating, mm. but I always found being in person with David, like very captivating. Mm. So, um, and obviously he has written, he wrote a book also called Dear Lover. And I, but again, I really think that his, uh, his work just shines when it's in person, when he can talk about it, when it's in movement, when he's answering questions, when he's working with people real time, mm -hmm. uh, which honestly I relate to, like I have, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts. I have a lot of ideas. I put things into framework, but I think that they kind of shine the most when I'm like, yeah, but how does that relate to you? And let's look at how we put that into play. Yes. Because none of these things are really static. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, credit to you, I've actually, we, we watch a lot of your stuff, and um, which is um, so cool to have a podcast. You're like, yeah, I'll just email the person who I'm really interested in, get her on the show, you know. But uh, I think that's really true. Like, I think, um, you know, having known you for approximately two minutes and the 38 seconds now, <laughs> what are we at, 12 minutes? Um, okay. I, I really love how you how you seem to anyway, interact with the audience. And it just seems like everything that you say seems to be so pertinent and relative. Um, there was a moment when, I don't know, you, there's so much work that you put out there, but there was a moment when I think someone asked from one of the workshops that you did, um, and he was talking about, you know, how to lead from the masculine side of things in a world now where, um, women are, are, are liberated and there's much more equality and things like that. And I think you made a really necessary distinction between feminism and then the, the archetypal or symbolic feminine. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. I'm not sure if you remember the workshop, but just about that kind of difference. In well, if, I, if, you're, if you're talking about the moment that I'm thinking of, I, I do remember it. There was definitely oh. one, one in particular. Um, and what I think was one of the key points of that particular interaction was, and then I'm just going to say this again, just because I do think that it's relevant uh, for heterosexual men, mm -hmm. right, who want to date women in this day and age, but who who come from, I mean, and, and I would really hope, I would hope, I would hope that everybody in this day and age comes from a feminist perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, I'm just like, come on, people. Totally. Um, totally. Like <laughs> And, but that too, so sometimes it's this idea like, oh, but I want to honor her as a feminist, right. which means I don't want to overstep. And, and, and what I said to him and what I would say in general is that if you're, if you're actually going to come from a truly feminist perspective, you would honor the feminine in her. Mm. You would also honor the masculine in her and honor her as a whole person and the whole, you know, the whole relationship. But that capacity, the capacity to actually honor the feminine part of her that desires to be led mm. or that desires to be claimed or that desires to surrender without assuming that that is, if, if you come from the perspective that seeing that in her makes her weak, mm. it's actually an unconscious way of assuming that that is weak. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. And I think, um, yeah, I, you know, it, this is the kind of stuff that's really important now, these kinds of deeper conversations around, uh, you know, relational dynamics and all that sort of stuff. And I, I really love it because it means we're now starting to think beyond just names and forms. We're starting to think beyond, you know, what we do as a representation of who we are and, um, I suppose that's one of the reasons why I gravitated um, to David's work is because I, um, you know, I was, I was starting to get interested in, I always had anxiety talking to girls, you know, growing up and all that sort of stuff. 
And um, I, I was like, I always wanted to have a girlfriend, you know, just from a very young age. I never really, um, I think maybe mainly because I was just lazy. I didn't really want to play the field too much because I couldn't be bothered with it. I wanted to play AFL, which is like our equivalent of uh, NFL down here. But um, yeah, like moving into this sort of stuff had always really, really interested me because it was, um, you know, we live in a world now and I, I grew up as a 27 year old now where um, the quality was, you know, we still have things that we need to push forward with and all that sort of stuff, but it's, I wasn't certainly raised in a very discriminatory time, you know, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but then moving into this sort of stuff, it's like, because we're starting to push for that equality now, how do we still create that desire and that like give and take and all that sort of stuff as well? So um, is that, what, what led you into this stuff? Um, what was your kind of background before you, uh, I suppose we should tell everyone what, what you do. Could you give us like a, a two minute rundown of, uh, I'm kind of running this show as like we've just been talking for ages. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, I think that's the best introduction um, to what I or, or anyone else does. But in, in the realm that you and I are talking in now is, I say definitely I work with men and women and couples um, in the realm of relationship, intimacy, communication. I also do work that's just for women. Um, and, and ultimately, I mean, I think some of the work that I do is very specific to sexual polarity, to intimacy in that romantic realm and how we do that. And then there's other bodies of work that are more like, how do we create our, how do we just create our relationships the way we want them? Mm -hmm. And one thread of that is sexual polarity. Mm -hmm. And it's an important thread. And there are other important threads, you know, so this year I, I created a program called Beyond Boundaries that I really specifically wanted to put out something that I thought was more holistic in the realm of boundaries that was for both, well, really all genders, you know, men, women, masculine, feminine, that wasn't coming, it was just like, like, oh, let's look at this in a broader way. So, um, and probably these days, the majority of work that I do is with women mm -hmm. in groups. And it's, again, it's from that perspective of what is it actually to be a whole woman? Mm. And what does it mean to walk through the world like in our embodied wholeness as women in this day and age? And then, of course, it interweaves with what you're talking about, which is what is it to be a man, you know, or what is it if a man wants to date women, then how do these things weave together? You know, so, so I, love, I love that weave. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What does it, what does it mean to be a woman in, in the, in this day and age? How, like, what are some of the things you touch on in the workshop? Uh, well, the, one of the places that I work on that is actually in my membership. So it's called the collective and it's just an on, it's an ongoing. And I think the reason that I did it in that format, rather than like, here's a workshop on how to be a whole woman, <laughs> although we do that, right? But it, it is, it's a little bit of what we touched on before, which is, can we allow for all the parts of ourselves mm. and not get caught in, oh, if I'm a woman, therefore I have to be feminine and feminine is only this and da, 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 da. but also not get caught in like, well, I'm a feminist woman. So therefore I can't, you know, want to be in a relationship or want a man to take care of me. And, and either one of those mm. are just boxes on one end of the spectrum or the other. And so my, all, all of the work is really around uh, ultimately breaking out of those boxes and saying, well, what do you actually want? What's the experience you want? And this is what I would say to that question about men wanting to date in this way too. It's like, what do you actually want? Yeah. And then we look at, so how do we go about creating that? You know, what, it, what are the practices? What is the energetic we need to bring? How do we expand your capacity? Not how do you become someone different than who you are, but how do you actually expand your capacity to express who you truly are so that you can create more of the experiences, the relationships, the intimacy in your life that you want, mm. the way you actually want it, you know, not some idea of the ideal relationship or. Yes. And, and the who you should be and, and, and yeah. all that sort of thing. Do you, do you think we're still um, kind of coming down from that trip of, of, um, you know, what it, what it means to have a happy, successful relationship and marriage. And there's still kind of like some social attachments to that. Absolutely. I mean, I think it changes and it morphs, but there's this seed that there is a way. Mm. So, you know, again, and, and I, I don't know, I, I've never been to Australia. Um, 
for instance, I don't know like how similar it would be in Australia and the United States. Or we can say, well, it's probably slightly different in like California or like Alabama. Sure. Or right, we get these, we get these geographical differences. And then we go like, well, my in my family system, it was showed to me like this. Mm. And then we go like, oh, but now I'm part of, you know, the conscious ecstatic dance community. And they say it's like this. Yeah. And so, but everywhere we go, it's just easy to look and go, oh, right. But to have the right kind of relationship here is like this. Mm. So I think even you asked this question a while back and we got, we got a little derailed, but like, <laughs> what is my background? Yes. And, and early, like my very first, um, forays, if you will, into teaching or coaching were leading a program called the Authentic Man Program. Mm. And that was actually in that realm of basically what if there's no cookie cutter molds and how do you have more of the kind of relationships with women you want to have? Mm. And, and it, even when you were saying like, oh, I felt a little awkward or I felt a little shy, I was like, yeah, that was exactly our demographic. Men who are like, I really want to have a relationship. And I like, how do I approach a woman or how do I? And, and so we would work in that realm, but really from this place of there are no cookie cutter molds. Like there's no, we're just going to give you the five step plan and then you'll be able to approach any woman. And yeah, the classic, the techniques and all of the tricks. Yeah. And, but the, and I think, I think we do have to keep kind of relearning this as we go because it's so easy as humans to just create a new box. Mm. Oh, I thought that the, the, the right relationship looked like X, Y, and Z. And then I busted out of that. And now it looks like, you know, QRST. Yeah. And then I busted out of that. And then I, and, and where we go like, Oh, so I really think what it's about is, is continuously actually going, so what structures uh, are consciously or unconsciously in place and do I want them that way? Mm. But the first step is actually going like, so, so what are they? What are the unconscious assumptions that I have or that my partner has? What habits have we just fallen into? Oh, you do that and I do this. Oh, this is how it goes on Saturday morning. And, and without any blame, shame, or judgment, just going like, well, do I want it? That, like, yeah. I want it that way. Yeah, that's so, that's so true as well because I think, um, yeah, shame, shame is such a, an important emotion to consider because I think, we, I think you're so right when, when you, when you mentioned that idea that we kind of fall into these habits and routines without actually, you know, necessarily putting our partners down or, or, you know, Hey, this is the way it's got to be on a Saturday morning. But, you know, you know, we have to have that moment of reflection and go, Whoa, like we've been doing this on a Saturday morning. Do we, do we want to be doing this? <laughs> yeah. And so often um, I think, I mean, again, if we're just talking about two people in an intimate relationship, one person will be like, well, if that's the way it is on Saturday morning, it must be the way they want it because I don't want it that way. Mm. And so one of the things I'll often teach is we'll get curious because they may be sitting over there going like, I guess that's how she wants it because that's what happens every Saturday. And both people are like, wah, wah, wah. Yeah. I guess we're doing what he wants. I guess we're doing what she wants. And both people are like, I actually wish it was slightly different. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. We're just not kind of. Because it is more of like the falling into rather than the consciously chosen, both in, you know, and in relationships, I think consciously chosen both individually and together. Yeah. 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 Totally. And then does it take a, when, when, when we fall into these kinds of routines and things, does it, does it take a, I mean, you can obviously assume that like an open, honest conversation would help kind of navigate that as well. But then I, I often think sometimes like, if there's too much openness and, and honesty in the, in the, in the relationship, does that sometimes detract from the, the mystery and the desire? So like, do, do you know what I mean? Like how can we find that balance between being honest and telling and expressing what we want, but at the same time having a bit of mystery, you know, so it's, it, we're, we, we always feel like we're dating each other. Mm -hmm. I love that question. So one of the things I think can be helpful because we often will come from the perspective of like, okay, so I'm going to share my truth mm -hmm. and I'm going to ask for what I want. And, and, and there's also a place of going like, Oh, what would be your fate? Like, what would be your favorite way to spend 
if, 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 you know, sky's the limit and we didn't have to do anything the way we've done it, how would you want to do it? Mm. And bringing that kind of curiosity to our partner or even just to another person, right? Like it could be a good friend, but we always get together and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, I guess that's what she wants, you know? And she's like, I guess that's what she wants. <laughs> but I do think that some of these things um, at their root apply across the board. How we apply them is sort of different depending on the type of relationship. But I think that has a different energetic of curiosity and like, oh, I really want to know what you want then, okay, so I, I just want to share some, you know, like I'm, I'm starting to get bored with how we do our Saturday morning. And I, you know, I just, I just, you know, I don't, I don't blame you at all, but I just have to air my truth. And I just yeah. have to let, this has a really different energy. So one of it is to look at how we do that. And sometimes putting our attention on the other person with curiosity can shift a dynamic in a different way than that. Like, okay, now I'm going to reveal my truth to you. And then you're like, what am I supposed to do with that? Yeah. And then I do think that just shifting things at the level of energetic dynamic, which we, we each really have the capacity to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, I talk about this more from the feminine perspective. I'm trying to come up with like a masculine example, but from the feminine perspective, you know, I hear a lot of women who are like, I wish he would just leave me more. And I'm like, great. So when he says, what do you want to do? You just say like, I don't know. What do you think, you know, that, that there's a way to respond rather than like, oh, like he's asking me again. Like, I guess I'll just plan everything again. <laughs> um, I don't understand why he never leaves me. Or he says like, oh, I think we should do this today. I'm like, um, so did you forget that we have X, Y, and Z to do? Right? There's all the ways from just the feminine perspective that I can change the dynamic and the way it's happening without having that sit down heart to heart. Let's talk about how we do our relationship mm -hmm. and the role you're going to play and the role I'm going to play, but where I can literally just start bringing the energetic that I would like to be in. Mm -hmm. If I'd like to be in the, in the role of like, I don't know what we're doing today. And like, he's going to make all the decisions I can just literally do that. Like, I don't know. What are we? What are we going to do today? Yeah. <laughs> and I can even, I can even um, feel that. Like, I can actually feel the difference in the way you're talking. Um, yeah. The difference between when you say things like, "Oh, you know, we should have this conversation." It is like a, a sense of dullness to it. But when you're kind of like, "Oh, I don't know," like I, I just feel the difference. Is that what you mean by like energy dynamics? That's part of it. I do think the inner, like that, that is part of it. And then some of it is, so if he was leading me well, how would I be feeling and responding? Mm. And, and actually taking some responsibility to feel and respond that way already mm. at, as an act of evoking that very, that very energetic so, um, and some of this has to do with, I think the ways, especially in intimate relationship, we want the permission or the approval to be or act a certain way. But we're like, will it be okay if I da, da, da? And there might be things where it's important to just sex. Like, so will it be okay? Is it okay to be like this? Or, you know, can, can we play in this realm? Yeah. Um, and then there's other times where I think it's really, it's, it's actually just our own kind of neurotic habit of waiting for approval and permission rather than just, if you know, from the masculine perspective, man or woman, uh, it's a risk to say like, Okay, you know, time to get your clothes on. I have a plan for us. This is what yeah, you need. Yeah. Like, like there's a risk. Mm -hmm. And and often we're waiting, we're like, oh, and you know, until she shows me that she would kind of like that from me. Or if she doesn't give me quite the response I want when I first show up that way, I'm gonna take it as a complete rejection of my whole plan and that I, sh I should probably never do this ever again. Yeah. <laughs> Which I understand. Like I say that with some humor, but with compassion. But it's the same, you know, from the feminine, right? Like, oh, I want to, I want him to respond to me in a certain way in order for me to like reveal my heart or reveal like my turn on or my pleasure. And so I think there is an element of doing our own personal work 
where we, there's enough wholeness. It's what I call wholeness. Anyway, there's enough wholeness. That's like, actually I can bring this energy and I'm not waiting for them to approve of it mm. or to give me permission or I'm not so um, desperate for that, that it's going to crush me if I don't get the exact kind of response I need in the exact moment that I need it. Yes. Yes. That makes total sense. And, and I think, you know, if I could just add a, a further to that, I feel like there would also be a, um, a sense of, at least from the, from the masculine perspective, a sense of um, uncertainty in how to lead in this world, because we're still riding that wave of, Oh, okay. It's actually not okay to do what that side has been doing for 10,000 years or, or whatever, you know, and there's that kind of like, okay, we live in a world now where that equality is so, so intrinsically important, you know, and everyone has individual sovereignty. We need that, you know? So then does leading still mean what it did in the early 19th century or, you know, um, there's still, I, I can imagine there'd still be some confusion around that. Yeah. It's so interesting. I was just talking about this earlier today too. And it is a place where I want to poke at men a little bit because I, I'm like, actually the things that are not okay now were actually never okay. Mm -hmm. It's actually just that women now feel safe enough to say that's not okay. Mm. And I, I'm, I'm just going to lump you into the category of like good men. (laughs) Um, We'll we'll start the podcast here actually, if you don't. (laughs) Most of the men that I come in contact with, you know, I would say are good men and that actually not from like a trying to figure it out, but when you sit in the seat of like, Oh, you know, just being the good man that you actually are, you, you actually do know. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not that there was a time in history when women liked to be harassed and now they don't. Actually, women never like to be harassed in the workplace. They just now feel safe enough to say, stop it. Mm. Um, and, that, and, and, I, and I get that at more like a psychological level and also kind of a fear level, those things get mapped over for men right now where it's like, oh, is it okay for me to do anything rather than what I would say is that that place of of pausing and finding one's own, you know, relaxation in your body and your, in your own seat is what I would call it. Like when you stand in your own or stand on your own feet, sit in your own seat, like you actually know, uh, there are a couple of things that might be gray areas, but for the most part, I think, you know, like, Oh, actually it would be okay to do this. Oh, right. That's like an old, that's a thing that was never okay. And I wouldn't even have wanted to do it. It was just some weird version of maleness or masculinity that was passed on to me, but telling a woman she's beautiful with an open heart and then being available to gauge whether she lights up and is like, Oh, you made my day or she gets a little rigid because who knows, you know, has nothing really to do with you, but it's just a moment to like, you know, I just blessed her with a compliment and I can actually back away without any blame, shame or judgment. Mm, mm. Yeah. Yeah. No. So I, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And actually, like, I think you said it rather lightly and you're like, I'd, I'd like to poke fun at men. Like I'd like, so you didn't say that. So I'd like to poke at men a little bit. Um, like I couldn't agree with you more with that. I think um, especially when it comes to the workplace and things like there's now that other pushback because I'm also interested in cultural issues as well. It's one of the things we talk about on the show and how things are changing as well. And you're like, Oh, what's okay. What's not okay. I actually just see that as an excuse. It's just like, it's obvious. It's like, what's your intent? Yes. Are you trying to harass or be a dickhead? Or are you just literally saying, Oh, you actually look really Cause there's a difference between saying there's a total difference between saying like, Oh, your hair is like so like in that real sleazy way, as opposed <laughs> to saying, "Oh, she actually really like your hair today." It's so different, and it's so obvious. You know that whole yeah. excuse of just like, "Where's the line now?" It's total bullshit. Yeah, thank you. I agree, and I and I think one of the things is has to do with power dynamics. You know, it's like, am I? Is there sort of a power? Not not just power imbalances per se, because even someone who's a boss talking to their employee 
can say your hair looks fantastic today in a way that she's just going to go like, Oh, I, that feels I, like I'm so delighted that you noticed. And she could be a lesbian, you know, and could still feel delightful. Right. It has it's good no, hair. It's good hair. <laughs> right. It's sort of one of, one of those things, but that sense like, Oh, I can do this because I have power yes. or I'm going to do this to gain power over you. Yes. That's more of the unconscious piece. And, and I, I agree. I think then there's this excuse and it, it is a great place. I'm glad that then there are men doing that work in the world to say like, Hey, stop using that as an excuse mm. and, and step into, um, just expressing in that way, like being willing to come forward with women in your life. Yes. Yeah, ab- absolutely. I suppose my, my, um, question was more around, we, we just watched, um, on the, funnily enough, we just watched um, On the Basis of Sex. Have you seen that movie about Ruth Ginsburg? No. Really good. Yeah, I have not, I've, yeah, I know what it, I know what it is, but I haven't actually watched it, yes. Yeah, no, it, it was, it was really, really cool. Um, it was really inspiring as well. Um, you know, man or woman, whatever, you just watch it and you're like, I want to take on the world. You know, you see someone doing <laughs> that and it's just awesome. Um, it's just like the, the world that they were living in where, the, the natural assumptions were, yes, women stay home, you know, and, and men go out and work. It was, it was not so much like that individual, should I harass her, you know, because it's obvious like everyone knows, like I totally agree with you. If you sat with yourself for a moment, you'd like, even though socioculturally this is accepted, quote unquote, I would still have that feeling of, you know, but then some people obviously went and did it anyway, which is not cool. But that that world back then where there were these, these, these kind of like natural socio-cultural assumptions about how men and women operated, which is kind of really getting blown up now, which is really cool. Um, does, did, does that ever come into the, the conversation around how, how, how the masculine can, can lead? I suppose. Does that, do, you, do you understand that at all? I'm not sure what the actual crux of the question is. The, so the yeah. way that roles, that cultural roles have changed and are changing. Yeah. So the, the number one thing that I can see is if we now live in a world where people can understand that it's not so much about what you do as -hmm. opposed to who you are in that moment and, and leading, you know, so if Mm -hmm. just, let's just take a classic example. Um, woman comes home, um, CEO of a major, like, you know, incredible business, kicking goals, whatever. And the, the man, so the, the, the roles have been swapped as an example. Mm-hmm. How, how can a, a woman kind of like find her flow if she wants to and, and, mm-hmm. and move into that space of, of wanting to be led and, and, and flow? And then how can then the man take on that role of um, taking the lead in that way? Yeah. So, so I think that's a great question. And again, I think it's just really important. You already said this, but, but it comes down to what do we want? Yes, of course. So, so I just think that's a really important place for people to continually return to mm. is really checking any place. Like, is this an assumption? Do, am I just assuming that I should be a CEO because that's what my mother taught me? Or am I just assuming like just any, and, and just like, is that what I want? Mm. Or even if it's not what I want at the highest is it what I'm going to do right now? And what am I working towards? You know, like, what do, how do I actually want things to go? Mm. Cause I do think that people have far more choice and power than they give themselves credit for in that way. Um, and let's just assume that that is something they want. Let's assume that for, for all kinds of reasons, um, she loves to like kick ass in the business world during the day and then and then wants to switch it around and in their intimate relationship they want it different and he loves taking care of the house or you know during the day and and this they're just like this is fantastic um and we just need to we need a little help in like how to turn it around when we come together so one of those I would say is kind of like anything that a little bit of transition is helpful. You know, I have this when, and it's been hard because we we're still having like stay at home measures and my kids are not in school. So they're doing distance learning. So we don't really have this transition between like, Oh, we're doing things in the morning. And then I'm like, and now you're at school. And we used to, even though it was very, very short, we had this like five minute drive to their school. Mm -hmm. And it was like this little transition, like, Oh, now I take you here. And then I get home and like, my life is different because you're gone. (laughs) Yeah. 
Um, and so, but I think that that is relevant in terms of, of relationships too, is going, is, is even just conscious awareness of, so this is a transition period and how am I going to use this transition to serve what I want next? Mm -hmm. Right. As she's coming home already knowing like, Oh, I, I want, when I get home, I really want to you know, there's relax. Like I just want to relax on the couch, but there's also like, Oh, I want to actually let go in a physio energetic way. I want to stop making decisions. You know, I want to, um, whatever, right. Already. If you think about these things, like it already is, it's just an imagination uh, and, and starting to project, Oh, that's how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Oh, I might imagine that I'm going to change my clothes, you know, thinking about these different things, how that can actually work. Even thinking about that, like already starting to maybe breathe differently. And that could all be on the car ride home. Or, you know, maybe you ride the subway home and it doesn't feel quite right to start letting down your guard on the subway. Who knows? But that, that awareness between two people, oh, we're going to see each other. And it, almost like a bow, you know, you might not physically bow, but there's a way of going like, oh, I see you. I see you. Okay. Now we're doing this little transition thing. Mm. And, and then finding, well, what is that? What is the, I mean, there are some typical examples that might have to do with breath or with relaxation, um, with changing one's clothes into something that expresses how they want to show up more, um, depending on if there's children, like that's like a whole other thing. But, you know, I would say, especially for both, I would say males and the masculine as an overgeneralization, some silence, right? Some stillness, um, a walk in nature. That's not like a, not like a walk in a busy park kind of nature or like yes. listening to a podcast or these kinds of things. And all of this does take attention. It takes attention and intention. It doesn't, it's not like, oh, it's just going to happen. We have to go like, oh yeah. So it matters enough to me that I'm going to be able to come back to my wife or my partner, uh, more resourced in this particular capacity. Therefore, you know, I'm going to go out, I'm going to go to the ocean where no one goes and I'm just going to let that silence of the waves Mm -hmm. have have that impact or we have one room in our house that all it has is a meditation cushion in it that's it right you know what I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna sit on that cushion I know right <laughs> even for 10 minutes could make a really big difference um dancing to one song to and it can be it can almost be anything mm -hmm. right it doesn't have to be something like oh it's all sensual necessarily just that movement and dancing to it and making sounds right it's already frees something in my body towards feminine energy and expression mm -hmm. um And then I think there is this piece. So there's that, that takes attention and intention and just choice and, 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 and that kind of like generosity of, oh, we're, we're really trying our best. So if we come together and I'm like, oh, you're not quite blah, blah, blah enough, you know, or something like, oh, like, oh I can actually feel where he's doing his best or I can feel where she's doing her best. And what if I bring my best, even if it doesn't seem perfect, you know, whatever, she hasn't quite let go enough for my preference. Yeah. <laughs> um, but can I, can I bring my best presence to it or, or some small piece of guidance, like, you know, soften your belly, look in my eyes and soften my belly, soften your belly or touch her, you know, just, but from that place, it's not like what you're doing is wrong, but oh, I'm going to, I'm going to help you here. Mm. So, so it's, um, yeah. So, cause that, 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 um, I really have a lot of questions around that. So like at the, at the, the very, very core principle of what the masculine is and the, the feminine is, um, trying to come into that. So yeah, could you, I was wondering if you could just touch on that actually, firstly, what, what they are at their base level, because, you know, um, some people might think of masculinity as, uh, I don't know, assertiveness or leadership and femininity is, um, I can't, I can't even think right now. What are some examples? <laughs> but it's like nice, nice, yes. softness, sweetness. Yes. Um, Agreeableness. And yeah. All right. And, and the, and the sort of stereotypical masculine is just sort of like stoic, 
or uh, my way or the highway or, or something like that. So, so I'll speak to that. And then I, I do want to touch again on this piece of what do, what does each person and what does the relationship actually want? Mm. Um, so I'm just going to put a little pin there. Don't let me forget that. Done. But I would say at its most sort of cosmic, it's almost like at its most cosmic and at its most basic, the masculine is, is consciousness. It is the space in which things happen. So we think about it as structure, container. And again, at its most cosmic and most basic, the feminine is everything else. Mm. <laughs> so literally, it is the energy of everything else. And, and then in a certain way, that can be found in anything. So uh, take a, like a yoga asana pose, the, the actual pose itself, the structure of it, that's the masculine form. And the, and, the, and the awareness that can hold it is the masculine essence of that. And then everything that's happening in the body and every and, and the breath, the breath is all the feminine, right? Everything that's happening is that all the thoughts about, oh, I'm doing this really well, or like this sucks and I hate it. All of that is the feminine. Mm. <laughs> so all the feminine expression, which is why I actually think it's important for people to come back to what do I actually want rather than saying, I want you to be more masculine. I want you to be more feminine. I want us to be in our masculine and feminine when we're together is like, Oh, there's a certain kind of holding I want when I come home from work, like your, um, your stillness and your gaze just in holding me as I let go from the day of work, like, ah, I, I, I need that so much. Mm. Right. Or he might want, like, I want to feel, I want to feel the softness of your heart. Um, I want to feel your love radiating from your eyes. Like I, I want, I want to, you know, so, something. So again, it can, it can come to some specificity, but it's more like there are textures that we actually want from each other. Mm that when we get too abstract into the masculine and the feminine, I think get lost. And we, the reason I think that matters is that it, it once again leaves both people dissatisfied. Like both people are just trying their fucking best. And then, and everyone's like a little bit chronically dissatisfied. And, and so being willing Again, to put the attention and intention in like, no, what really, like, what do I really love mm. in this moment or at this, you know, point in this, this, this aspect of the day or this, this is something I want from you at this time. Or, um, and then, and then being willing to be vulnerable enough to, to reveal in that way, mm. you know, like, ah, oh, you know, I, I just can't even tell you like how nourishing it is when I walk in the door and you stop whatever you're doing and you like turn your body towards me and you just ask me how I am. Mm. Right. And then I'm like, you know, suddenly you hear that. I mean, if I, even as like a woman, I'm just like, Oh man, like I want to do that. Totally. I was just I was like, should I do it now? <laughs> <laughs> and again, you know, this goes back to something you asked before, which is like, how do we not get bogged down in like, I want to reveal my truth and how do we keep some of that mystery like so much is that way of, of our willingness to, uh, like in the way in which we reveal it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It, it's, um, I, I love that you having said that, I love that you keep coming back to that. What do we actually want? Because I, I think for, for me, when I first started looking into this work, I was kind of like, Oh, okay. I need to be more masculine, you know? And then I was just like, well, I'm not really happy doing this. And I, I did it again and I was writing my books and I just became like a dickhead, you know, like I was not terribly, um, but I was constantly, I was very kind of, um, what's the word? Like resentful if things weren't perfect. I didn't have my hours to write my books and all that sort of stuff. And then I started to realize, well, hang on, you know, to your point, like, I feel like I just need to be more me and, you know, writing a book is, I love to write so much. And that's when I allow my, you know, get, allow myself to get lost in my head and the thoughts to go, well, we'll do this and do this. And it's crazy in there, but it's so fun. And, yeah. um, you know, and another weird example that's coming to me right now is, um, 
you know, when we, when we go to sleep, um, I make sure that my legs kind of touching her leg. Cause I, I, I like that we both touch, you know, things like yeah. that. I think that's kind of a love language for me, but, um, you know, when I, like I said, when I first started looking into this, I basically just put myself in a new box, as you say, like, it's like, Oh, okay. Now I need to be more masculine as opposed to really thinking, well, hang on. I need to really allow myself to be fully me in both of those two dualities. Yeah, and and there's just the full spectrum of all of them. Mm. It's really, I mean, again, I think we sometimes I just want to throw away like all the distinctions because every distinction, every framework gets turned around to, you know, like to shame somebody. It's like, yeah. oh. <laughs> and really, I think that where they're valuable is when they give us the freedom to be who we are. Mm. So, for instance, a lot of heterosexual men and, and also some homosexual men that I know actually want a lot of space. And they're like, oh, but I, that's not okay. And it, that would harm my partner. And I want to be a good emotional man, you know, like present day egalitarian <laughs> man available for emotions. And, and also, I do think in both the therapeutic and the personal growth realm, there's this idea that, that, um, like closer is more connected. Mm. Closer is more relationship rather than the understanding that actually the, I mean, first of all, it's very, very personal, but that's coming from the feminine perspective, which has kind of dominated the therapeutic and the personal growth realm to some extent, mm -hmm. at least in the area of relationship, right? So like if we're closer, we're more intimate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> which, can be can also can be its own trauma response, right? We can have avoidant uh, tendencies, and that can be a certain trauma response. But so can like you know needing to be too close. You can't go. You can't go anywhere without me. You know, I don't know. We're connected. Yeah. And it can look like men are less committed, or men don't want to be in a relationship, or men aren't working on the relationship. When a lot of times it's like, oh, I actually just I need more space so that I can show up for you in the way that I want to show up for you. Mm. Mm. So if some if something like the way of the superior man or understanding like oh that's a masculine tendency, not just male but a masculine tendency, if that can create freedom in a relationship, then hallelujah. Mm. But if it's like oh now I'm supposed to stand still and like not cry, you know, or something, then yeah. and it doesn't create more freedom, then I think it's not helpful. Yeah, that's such a great point. So so whatever is. Um, inhibiting our freedom, that's, that's kind of worth looking at, at the very least. Yeah, or like, you know, we could call it, again, it's also like, like that's it's kind of a masculine perspective, whatever creates more freedom. We could say what creates more love? Like, does it actually create more love if I just stand here and try not to blink, you know, so that you'll know that I'm present with you? Like, no, it doesn't actually create more love. And there's not more, more life, or air in the relationship either. So, so looking at these things, like how do I expand my capacity to be more of me in a way that gives you more of what you also want and allows our relationship to, to blossom. Mm. Mm. I, I feel like you're like totally a fly on the wall when you were like, I feel like that, that was me. As a girl. <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> Did I do it right? <laughs> so funny. That's hilarious. Oh, it's yeah. And, and I actually, um, you know, to your point in the very beginning about, um, some of David's writings, um, it was actually when I read, I think blue truth and finding God through sex, I think they were my, the ones yes. that really made a lot of sense to me because it was much more about, uh, cause he started to speak a lot more about, um, how can you remain open, uh, during times of when you're getting all this energy here or getting all this energy here. Uh, the thing that helped, me a lot was actually not so much when, when I took from the work in the beginning was I need to be kind of like this stoic dude that's always thinking about death. And, you know, it was always like, Oh, you know, you know, I just became like a, um, like a statue, like a weird kind of statue, not terribly. I mean, I still had a life, but there was that yeah. weird kind of thing going on there. And then I think when he started writing about, um, staying open and all that sort of stuff, the first thing that helped me was actually noticing parts of myself that I close off to like in like weird emotions, like around disgust and fear. And I was like, Oh wow, perhaps I need to focus on this more before the outside world is like maybe like level two or something. Yeah. I, I really love that. Um, 
what you just said about where you close off to yourself. Because I, I, I think many, many people of all genders, sexual orientations, but that there's a, it's almost like we want to hand those parts to other people and say, here, you, you approve of this because I, I can't, Mm. I don't know how to approve of this part of myself yet, but maybe if you approve of it, it'll be okay. (laughs) It's like, it's like, it's like, Oh, like I'm closing off to this part, but then I'm kind of demanding at the same time that my partner love it. Mm. Why don't you love this part of me? I hate it. (laughs) Pick it up. (laughs) Yeah. And it's, it's so funny. So again, that's where I think this piece around range, you know, can I be like this and can I be like this and can I hold inside of this is helpful because when we start to actually open to those parts in ourself, we start to release the demand that the people in our life accept and love them for us. Mm. Mm. And I, and I love that you reminded me of blue truth because I actually do love that book. And I, I'm pretty sure it's in that book because one of the quotes that I always think of is basically like, this is as God as God gets. Mm. And it's just that sense like there's no, there's literally no better moment. Nothing's ever going to get better than this moment. Like nothing's ever, if I can't open to this moment, there's no, that, that's it. Yes. Yes. It's so true. Yeah. The, the um, you know, he's writing about, um, this uh this kind of spiritual dude named Mykonos I think from memory is like smoking a cigarette super fat you know doesn't care and and he's like um helping this spiritual seeker who like meditates every day for four hours has been you know yeah. eating vegan doesn't eat you know and he's like you know one of the first things he's like are you happy you know they're like sitting at a restaurant or something he's like you, you don't even look happy and I think yeah. um that kind of holier than now um, spiritual, you don't even need to fall into that place, but on the beginning, it's like, okay, I need to stop doing this. And I stopped doing this and you wind yourself up into a ball. You're like, Oh my God, I'm so spiritual. You know, <laughs> and then you yeah. come out of that and you're like, Oh man, like what was I doing? I'm so tightly wound up. And that's kind of like that very funny paradox of that's been written about in all the traditions and philosophies that, um, finding yourself is losing yourself and, you know, uh, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, still the same. Yeah. You realize, you know, when you come back, it's just kind of like nothing's really changed. I'm just like a little bit happier, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah, I haven't been able to figure that one out. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not enlightened. Yeah, and and I mean, I don't know. Maybe there are truly people who are like enlightened, enlightened. Um, but I, I find for myself and what seems to actually serve people is that sense of, oh, it's a, it's a gesture in that direction in any moment. And what, um, like every single moment gives us the opportunity to, to choose again. Like, yeah. oh, what, what, is, what is the gesture towards openness or um, happiness, not so much in the like, I'm so happy, but, but to enjoying this moment such as it is. Mm. And it's so interesting because you brought up the death piece. And I think this was even before I'd really heard David talk about this, but I remember having this moment with my partner at the time. This was many, many years ago. Yeah. Mm. Really around, it was this idea because, because I grew up Buddhist and in Buddhism, the idea is that you're, you're, all of your practice is like for your moment of death so that you can basically stay open. They don't talk about it as open, but so you can stay open in the moment of death and not be reborn or something. Mm. Uh, and, and I thought we have no idea what the moment of death is actually going to look like. Like what if the moment of death looks like my partner rejecting me? True. Good point. Yeah. Right. Or, uh, like it, it literally could manifest in any way. And we're like, well, this isn't the, mo- I like, I, I'm going to know what I die. Like, this isn't the moment of death. This is a moment to like be mad at my partner. Totally. Yeah. We actually have no, I, we don't, I don't know. I could be dying right now. This could be what death is like. Like, I don't know. Mm. And so it's that it's, it, again, it's that question of like, can I just embrace this moment? Like it's the moment I'm dying. Yes. Like this is literally what death is going to look like when he comes to say like, time's up, Kendra. <laughs> yeah, my God. Imagine that. <laughs> oh, your death? <laughs> it's my ex-partner. Right. <laughs> so, 
So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know that's such a good point. It is a good point because then again, it's it's kind of like, okay, I need to remain open and, you know, thinking about death. Again, you've still lost yourself in the future. It's like, well, I need to make sure that I'm good for that place. And it's taken you away from the now. Yeah, which actually, I mean, I think this is an interesting just place to go in here is because a lot of times we can also get lost in like, oh, what does it mean to be open? And does that mean I don't have any boundaries or I'm always nice or I never get angry or right? Like, is that open? Or if this is the moment of death, like how am I supposed to even be in the moment of death? What does that actually mean? Um, and I remember about five years ago, uh, someone in my community died in a fairly sudden and tragic way. And he was very young. He was like 34 or something like that. And, um, and of course, you know, and I've seen this happen since then too, just this outpouring of love and like, oh, I just wish I could tell him I love him one more time. And, and I thought, oh, that's so true. And then there's this other side. Like we, we, we like to think that that's all that death shows us. Death just shows us like all I would ever do is just, I just want to tell you, I love you one more time. You know, I just want to hug you one more time. And I think that, that as human beings, it's like, we have to hold that kind of right close to the skin. Like, yeah, what if, what if I never did see this person again and how am I going to be with them? And then also, what if I had to live with them for the next 50 years? What then needs to be said or done? And, and we don't actually do each other any favors by bullshitting. Like, oh, I'm just going to tell you, I love you all the time. And rather than, you know, like Jesus fucking Christ, could you pick up your fucking socks, you know? <laughs> and if, and if, if we're going to live together for the next 50 years, part of staying open is including like, okay, dude, socks. Yes, now. <laughs> and that's actually love, right? That's actually also love. Totally, totally. And it, because it's truth. And I, I had a, I had a client when I was working as a counselor and she, uh, you know, ended up pathologizing her own grief unconsciously, of course, because her father died. Um, and socially and of course very much so within herself as well she was like oh you know as my father I'm trying to get over the fact that I'll never see him again but also he had a lot of issues and he wasn't the perfect guy at all and she had to um you know um I I don't think he had his affairs in order and I don't think he had his will in order for memory and all this sort of stuff so she had to go there and clean the whole house and she found things that she didn't like and so there was this also this resentment and this anger towards him and then the, uh, the reason I say pathology is because it, it divided her between like, I know I should feel only love and sadness, but I also hate him right now. You know, yes. so I think your point is so, um, so true. Yes. And that piece that you're talking about, I mean, it's certainly true about things like love and grief and our families, but I think it's true about many things is actually how do we develop the capacity to hold multiple stories at the same time? Mm or multiple truths at the same time. Like I'm really angry at my father and I really miss him. Yeah. And they're both true at the exact same moment and neither one negates the other. Mm. And, and in relationship, I mean, certainly just with ourselves in our own life, that's important, but in our relationships and especially the people that we want to be most intimate with, whether they're romantic intimacies or not, but those people that we want to deeply love, there's going to be like multiplicity in that. Oh, this thing is so annoying and you're my favorite person on earth, you know, or like I can't imagine living without you and, at the, and I want to murder you every time your socks are on the floor. Like we're like, how can these two things exist at the same time? But they, they actually do. And it's just our, we get caught in our minds about it. And so we can develop that capacity to be like, oh, these are actually both true. They're both equally true and they don't negate each other. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And Kendra, I have to ask, are there socks on the floor right now? No, you're absolutely right. I, I think um, one thing as well that I wanted to ask is, do you, do you notice any um, similar questions or concerns or frustrations arising from the kind of the workshops and the work you do? Like are there, things that can continue to arise um, from the feminine perspective um, and from the masculine say, oh, I wish they would do this or wish, or how can I get a guy or how can I get a girl or, or whatever it is to, to do that. Are you noticing any similarities? 
between masculine and feminine practitioners or like commonalities, you know, I'm just always hear this from the women, always yes. hear this from the, the, the last, uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, honestly, the big, like the big one from the women is always like, I just want him to lead me more. Mm. But again, I mean, so it's great for men to hear that actually women want you to lead them. <laughs> Go ahead <and> do the work. <laughs> um, they want, they, there's this desire for that. The, the thing that I will often then end up poking at women, you know, who are saying this, who are wanting this, is how often they, they don't actually let it happen. And too often, I have like a whole piece I want to do about this. Uh, it's like, I just want to trust him. I wish, you know, I wish he would just show up and I could just trust him. And I'm like, you're conflating trust with somebody doing what you want them to do. Mm. Or this idea that if he led you, he would tell you to do everything the way you already want it done. <laughs> that And that's not the same thing. Yeah. So I have a lot of compassion. I mean, I have a lot of compassion for women in this perspective because I know that that is it's a it's enormously vulnerable. It is a big act of trust. But I also have a lot of compassion for men because they're like, why do women keep saying that they want us to lead them and then rejecting our leadership? <laughs> so to the men, I would mostly say um, that some persistence is really important. And that's, that's different than like, I'm just going to make her do what I said. Right. But that you just like come to dinner with me. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to, I'm going to kind of hold steady with that trusting that that she actually does want it you know again in a relationship like women don't want to be followed if they told you not to follow them but but in a relationship she actually does want that kind of guidance or leadership or taking the reins and she doesn't yet know how to allow it and then inside of that I find that a little bit of humor right not laughing at her but just that little bit of humor like oh you're so cute when you resist my leadership you know <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> So um, oh, oh, like, oh, you, oh, you, so you would like to make all the decisions. Okay, cool. You know, like, but internally, I mean, sometimes it's a little bit of external humor. I find even more than that, it's the internal, like, oh, this doesn't mean anything about me or about her. Mm. This is like compulsive resistance. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, it's helpful for men. Mm. Men tend to like they, you know, similarly, they want some what might they might call surrender um, or trust. Oftentimes it's like I really want women to trust me. And women are like, yeah, we'll be trustable, you know, jackass. <laughs> and I think it's a fair point. Again, there's sort of a corollary. Um, mm. of if and it's less like oh you have to be perfect but if you want her to trust you then you know actually say what you can truly deliver on and then truly deliver on it and don't if you can't deliver on it it's not more trustable to say like yes I'll do all the things it's actually more trustable to say actually I can't do all of those which one is most important mm. or it's more trustable to say I'm not sure how to lead you best right now. Mm, that's good. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, 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 and, and it's different to be like, I don't know, maybe I'm trying so hard, you know, but just like, like, okay, so, so I'm not, I'm not actually sure the best way. Like I really want to hold you here. I want to guide you here. I want to support you here. I'm not sure the best way to do that right now. Mm, mm. Or so, so being willing to admit some fallibility actually often is more trustable mm. yeah that makes total sense and, and even just the way you like most most people who um subscribe to the show listen to it but um you know if you guys listening like just the way you said that i'm kind of like not sure how to trust you like i really noticed like a real kind of i'm i'm not um, shaming myself. I'm not like angry at myself because I can't do it. I'm literally just telling you, I don't know how to do it, but I really want to learn or I, I, I want to get to yeah. that place where I can. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. And so I'm wondering if we could just take a quick dive. I know I'm wary of the time, but um, I want you on here for hours, Kendra. <laughs> Bright notes. Yeah. Should be. Um, what, what does, 
what do you actually mean by leadership, like to lead? I wonder if we could just dive into that a bit more. It's a tricky, it's a tricky one because again, if I get into the nuance, I actually think, um, you know, it's, it's like a little bit of a joke sometimes the idea of topping from the bottom. Like I think there is feminine leadership and there's masculine leadership. So I would say more often, probably when I have used the term and I've been talking about the masculine, what I'm talking about is guidance or structure. Mm -hmm. So something that came up in, in one of my longer term programs recently was uh, a woman and for her it was around business and she was just talking about like oh my god and then I just worked myself too hard and I and you know I just don't want to do things the masculine way anymore which is overworking and overworking and overworking and um and I said okay well we need to backtrack here my love because you're calling all of that your masculine and sort of, again, you're actually shaming the masculine in that way, saying everything negative that you've been doing is the masculine, when part of what happened is that you've rejected your own sacred masculine. I called it like sacred daddy energy, like the father we all wish we had, which totally loves us, but says like, time to put your toys down now and come to dinner. Mm. Ah, I don't want to, I'm, you know, I'm in the middle of something. I just need to color one more page like I totally understand you're going to set your coloring book aside and you're going to come to dinner and that actually that part inside any of us is the one who will say you've worked hard enough today like like you you know you just worked for five hours and I know you're still inspired and it's time to stop mm. this is not this is actually not in service of you or of life that's actually the masculine and it's nice it's nice sometimes if we have someone outside of ourselves that will do that or here, have some food you need to eat, right? Yes. These, these, are, these are moments of, of structure uh, and guidance. And I also think it's important that we all know how to do that for ourselves. Yeah. And so in a way, that dynamic that happens inside, I see it happen inside a fem females a lot, is like, oh, like the flow and the feminine is just all going to feel good. And I'm like, actually, it was also your feminine that was throwing a temper tantrum that had you work 18 hours because you resisted the sacred masculine inside yourself that at some point knew it was actually time to stop work. Mm. Mm, that's such a good point. Because you can, you, can you can see that dynamic with everything, you know, just to, you know, bring it back to writing. I know that I wouldn't be able to fall in and lose myself in ideas without consciously saying, no, 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 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. or whatever is my writing time. So yes. that, that, that they play together. They do. And that's a, that's a brilliant example because how all your, like your creativity and the way your mind just goes all over, that's your feminine. Yes. So the part of you that might at some, you know, at some time you might have thought like, Oh, I, you know, I don't want to be in my feminine. Like I don't, I, you know, that's, that's, that's weak or that's, you know, my partner's not going to find it attractive or whatever would also negate that side. Mm. That's just like wild ideas. And now it might not work in your life or in your relationship if you just let that run wild, you know, so that like none of the bills got paid. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact that you can come in and you go 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. And, and this is actually a really key point. Not only do you show up at 6 a.m., but you also end at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. Now, you may not have to be rigid about that every single time, like on the dot, you never go 10 minutes over. But basically the part that's like, no, 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 no. I'm just like really in an idea. Totally which you have and which women have, you know, like these kinds of things. It's like, but actually we have to trust ourselves. We have to go like, no, this is what's set aside. And then, you know, actually what comes next is breakfast. And if you don't eat breakfast, things don't go well. Right. Like that sacred daddy work. <laughs> yes. yes, absolutely. I, I, should, I should probably call dad after. So, so I do think that I, you know, I and maybe others, but, but it's a little sloppy to just say leadership because you know, partly what I was bringing in before is the way, like, I can lead my relationship by bringing feminine energy yeah. to shift a dynamic. Like, that's actually a feminine leadership of, oh, I'm going to show up in this way, or I see my partner needs a little something. He would never ask for it. He might even not say he likes it, you know, but, like, I know that it actually changes everything for the better. And, um, or I, you know, I talk about this in the sense, I have, a, have an article called Let Him Lead You, in parentheses, badly. 
And, and I talk about this moment when my partner, like, again, he had created this whole day and we'd gone canoeing with our daughter and like everything was really great. And then there was just like this moment at the end where we're in the parking lot and everything's a little chaotic. And he was like, I, I don't know, like, I don't know where we should eat or say, you know, something like this. And it's like chronic complaint of women. Like, why is he always asking me where we should go to eat? <laughs> and rather than either making the decision or complaining about it or something like that, you know, there, I just turned to him and I was like, oh, I, I like, I trust you. Mm. But I had to also, I mean, I do trust him. Whether he knows where we should go to eat or not, I do, right? So women are like, but what if I don't trust him? I'm like, then you shouldn't be with him. If you don't actually trust anything about him, you shouldn't be with him. And if you do trust him, you should be able to find that even in a moment where you're a little bit questioning him mm-hmm. or he's not showing up as his absolute perfect masculine self. You should be able to find that part that goes like, I actually do trust him. And no matter what happens right now, it's true. It's actually true for me to say, like, I trust you. Mm-hmm. And then he was like, oh, we're going to da 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 And he, he knew exactly what we do. He just got fritzed out in a moment. Right? So that was feminine leadership mm-hmm. that allowed him to take masculine leadership. That's such a good point. I think that's such a good point because it's, yeah, you, you, yeah. I mean, I'm learning as I'm going here. That's why I'm loving it. But it's, it's so right that leadership is an inherently one essence it can come from both sides. And I mean, you can just think of one, you know, one classic example of, um, I don't know why this came to me, but, um, <laughs> you know, in the movie Grease, like, I got chills, they're multiplying. And she's yeah. like bringing him along and she's in her body and he's like, he can't get enough of it. She's like pulling him, you know, yes. that sounds to me like it's feminine leadership. Yes. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> I don't know why it came to me. I've watched that movie like 10 years. It was like my favorite movie when I was about 13 years old. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It's a good movie. <laughs> I don't know why that came to me. That's so bizarre. I have to see yeah. with that. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's actually really important though, because, um, w- more feminine essence women or women who are wanting to have that experience will often be like, yeah, but what can I do? Cause he's the one who's supposed to take leadership. And I think it is helpful to remember even this part, I guess I'll talk they'll be like, but he's always asking me. And, and it's almost like, well, then I'm obligated to answer. Mm-hmm. Like I literally will just completely empty my mind and I'll just be like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And it's not like, I'm not a ditzy person, but I can do that. Yep. If that's part of the dynamic I want to create yes. and, you know, like in two minutes or then I'm going to come on your show or I'm going to lead a course or I'm going to do this. Like I know how to think that's not, there's nothing is lost. Like nothing is lost for me, but I can genuinely say like, I don't know what, I don't like, I don't know where we're supposed to go tonight or like, I, I don't know what we're doing later today. Or I don't, you know, I can just. Turn it off. That's what you need. Yeah. And look, it it brings us full circle. Um, You just, you have to think about what, what it is that you want, you know? And I I think that, and I'm speaking from personal experience as well. It sounds like you're touching on this a lot, which I think is really important is that we can get lost in the definitions and labels. I need to be a bit more this. I need to have a bit of spice and cinnamon over here and a bit more masculinity in the pie there. And and it's just like, fucking hell, like, this is what I want to do. I just want to, I want to have this kind of relationship. I want to write my books and I want to like play with the dog, you know, and then yeah. move towards that. And then, and then really getting to that place of I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm allowed to kind of go for those goals. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that's actually, it's beautiful because there's, I don't know if this is true for you personally or not, but I think for many people, I mean, there's almost a tenderness when you say that I'm allowed, I'm allowed to go for that. Mm. And, um, and I think that is a place of tenderness for most people. Like, am I, am I actually allowed to want what I want? Like, am I allowed to like my relationship like this? And we can get stuck in that on any end of the spectrum, you know, whether it conforms to cultural norms or it doesn't, or it fits into our community or it doesn't or something like, am I allowed, am I allowed to want that? Yeah. <laughs> and it will just be, yes, yes, you are. You're allowed to want that. Totally. Totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Kendra, this has been so um, brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, are you, are you, what's coming up for you at the moment? Is there anything like workshops and things that you're uh, planning to put out there or? 
Um, well, I don't know exactly when this is going to air and whatnot. I mean, the best way for people always is to go to my website, which is KendraKunov.com. And there's always like the work with me, you know, so it's just, you can always look there. There's also a whole, there's a lot of blogs. And so a lot of the things okay. we've talked about, I've written about, and there's videos associated with them. Um, here at the end of 2020, the main thing that's coming up is a program I lead called the No Man Diet. So it's for women who are consciously stepping out of uh, being in relationship, dating, sex, intimacy in that way, uh, in a conscious way, basically not like, so I don't need a partner, but to do that, to do that inner work, to then choose the kind of partner that they truly want to have. That's cool. That's really cool. I love that program. Yeah, I like the name of it, the No Man Diet. It's classic. Yeah. I'm glad you like it because sometimes I get men who are like, "What's you know, what do, what don't you like about men?" I'm like, "Nothing." Like, come on, people. <laughs> like, I love everything about men. <laughs> totally, totally. And it's not, it's not about that. Like, I, you need you need time to. Um, I've heard John Wyland talk about the feminine cleanse before. It's not even about again, like people that say that. I think just get lost in the names. It's like it's basically time for yourself. And also, if um, if you're a woman and you have been attracting the wrong kinds of relationships and things like absolutely you need that kind of program. You need to figure out what's going on and take time for yourself. Yeah. But how, why do you hate men? (laughs) (laughs) Amazing Kendra. So that's K E N D R A C U N O V.com is your website. Awesome. Yeah. And your Instagram, obviously, as well. That's how we um, connected. With the you. great thing about having a name like Kendra Kunoff is, like, if, if somebody Google's me, <laughs> it's hard not to find me. You know, there's not there's not like a whole slew of Kendra Kunoffs out there doing other <laughs> personal growth work. <laughs> totally, you would save so much money on um, Google Ads. <laughs> you just don't need to <laughs> organic growth. <laughs> That's classic. Well, Kendra, thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, I'd love to get you back on um, at at, uh, at some stage as well. I feel like I really do feel like we could talk for a lot longer. And, yeah, you know, it was really wonderful. Awesome. Guys, thanks so much for listening. Talk next week. Bye. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.